Welcome to the first ASGSR webinar. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Travis Boone, who is an engineer at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. Dr. Boone will discuss his work on biological analysis systems for the International Space Station, small satellite spacecraft, and search for life probes. This presentation was originally given on February 20th, 2021, and there is a small portion of the introduction from Dr. Travis Boone that is missing. I wanted to give some examples that fall under each of these three uh, regimes, as, as you'll see that I call them. Um, so I thought breaking it down by regime or distance that we're doing these uh, biological experiments in space, uh, just a way that I like to, to bin it, <laughs> to think about it. The first would be um, what we do on the International Space Station. And those experiments are performed by astronauts with the devices that we build and train them on. Uh, the second regime, I would say, is, is small sats. Um, and they are second type. And those are autonomous experiments on, on smaller satellites that go out uh, still close to the uh, Earth or Moon. And the final one is the interplanetary uh, astrobiotype probes that go out, which uh, we just saw a big one the other day with uh, Perseverance landing. So let me break it down by distance, as I mentioned. Uh, the first is low Earth orbit. So obviously, the, the International Space Station is there, you're probably familiar, it's, it's only uh, 250 miles or kilometers up, um, circles once every 90 minutes. And there we do experiments uh, on doing sample prep in space, like cell lysing, RNA extraction, and RNA expression analysis. We use PCR to do that. Uh, we're also working on being a front end for sequencing, which is also um, uh, an area of investigation that a lot of folks are interested in for the space station. Uh, we also do some missions that have to do with cell growth, like the stem cell proliferation, differentiation, and regeneration. The, also in LEO would be the small sets. We have ones that, that go out and do things like look at antibiotic resistance of E. coli variants. Uh, there are photosynthetic microbe type payloads that go up in, in satellites, plant germination studies. So those are all in that first re regime. The second one I'll call cis-lunar. It's a little bit out of your view. Uh, you can see it next to the, our uh, camera views here. But that's going out beyond Earth's magnetosphere to where there's much higher radiation and you have SPE, solar particle events, which are basically like from, from sun flares. Um, and we want to see the effects of those on living organisms, of course, because of longer duration and further travel. Uh, that's that's important for for humans. And there are basically different gravity wells in between the Earth and the Moon, and at points between the Earth, Moon, and Sun, where basically the gravitational pulls are 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 balanced. And a spacecraft can kind of hang out in a little mini orbit out there and stay in that that gravity well, if you will. And the final one that I mentioned, of course, is the interplanetary. So whether it's Moon, Mars, Europa, Enceladus, uh, where we're working on things like nanopore sizing and sequencing of polyionic molecules. Those would be like information carriers, sort of like RNA or DNA, but maybe they don't look like that if they're out there. Uh, electrochemical analysis, also using electrophoretic separations to look at different, look for different chiral molecules, which if there's an imbalance in that is often a sign of life. Uh, and we have projects on lipid detection, which I'll talk about a little bit, which uses mostly mass spec as its analysis. Uh, there are also imaging projects where we want to get a sample and literally look for particles or cells or, or small biological molecules that are large enough to be seen with a, a high resolution camera. So first I wanted to talk about um, the wet lab two system. That's what we do with the space station. Uh, so these two tools are, it's a suite of handheld devices to enable space biology to be performed on station. So that would be a gene expression analysis, environmental contamination is one thing we looked into that we're not actively doing right now. But the idea is to increase the uh, efficiency of doing research. So in the past, it could take months to do an experiment on the space station, preserve the sample, down mass it, do the ground analysis, 
and then follow up on a reflight with the follow up experiment. So now we do, can do that loop basically in a day. We can do the onboard experiment, downlink the data, run the contr uh, controls on the ground, make a decision about the last experiment, and and move forward. You know, the, the next day if if uh, if it was scheduled. So that that's a big change on how. Uh, some biological research can, can be done now on station and the time scales. So, which gives us, of course, higher throughput. So for gene expression, what we're looking at is from DNA, you have the RNA that, that carries the, the, the transcripted messages or specific genes to code for the proteins, the amino acids of the proteins. And those are the, the machinery that the workhorses that, that really run all the functions in our cells. However, if the cells feel a stress, now these could be any kind of cells, uh, you know, human, uh, uh, bacteria, et cetera, mouse. Um, stresses could be uh, extreme heat or could be a toxin, could be radiation, could just be zero gravity, going to microgravity. And when that happens, you get different expression of the, the RNAs. And we track specific ones that, that PIs are interested in for their particular uh, studies. So we are payload developers on this project and we build those devices and we test them in this case in, in weightlessness before they go to station, before they're launched. Um, then we train the crew members, the astronauts, and ha have our payloads launched. And usually they make it up there. <laughs> Once in a while something blows up, but that's become more and more rare. And then we do the communications with the ISS because uh, the, the, the crew gets trained on a lot of experiments and ours tend to be ones where they don't have their hands available. For instance, they might be in a glove bag like you see in the, in the picture here. So we need to be in real time talking them through the two to four hours of, of operations, let's say. So the kind of uh, devices that we use on station for this uh, can be as simple as syringes. <laughs> surprise, surprise, holding fluids or samples. Um, we make some small units like buffer exchangers that allow you to take a sample and exchange what media it's in, what fluid, and that's the first step in some in some experiments, some assays. We have a, a syringe heater that we built for different size syringes that is needed for denaturing steps in some assays uh, before the uh, uh, PCR can be done. The heart of the module up on, on station is our sample prep module that is manually operated, but it lyses cells, binds RNA, then you wash and elute that RNA. Sorry, <laughs> let's go this way. And then another important thing is to be able to debubble fluids. And we have a, a couple ways of doing that. Uh, one is a device that has basically a hydrophobic membrane that we run uh, air and fluid through and uh, reject the, the air. Um, just imagine, you know, Gore-Tex like uh, vapor out, but, but like we can't get in the other side. We also have started using over the past few years, debubblers that are just based on capillary action. Since in microgravity with, without gravity, the fluids pretty easily flow and, and are dominated by the capillary forces. So if you have a device that has some very thin necked down areas, the fluid will flow there with just some simple motivation. You can just, the, the crew member can just wrist flick it essentially. And we use that to, for instance, load uh, pipette tips and a repeater pipette uh, to allow us to inject small volumes of liquid or sample into reaction tubes. In this case, these reaction tubes are to do PCR in a thermocycler. They're about the size of a, of a, a half a 50 cent piece or bigger than a quarter, what you see on the screen there, this guy right here. And they have lyophilized reagents like the primers and probes that are needed for PCR. So PCR, for, if you're not familiar, is polymerase chain reaction, and that's to amplify uh, DNA or, or, or RNA sequences of interest. We then use a, these sit on a rotor and we spin those on a cordless drill up on station and then go to a thermocycler. And after 90 minutes, get data that we can downlink. Uh, just earlier this week, actually, we did operations with Kate Rubens, uh, one of the crew members up there now, and uh, using pins to basically impale a tissue. In this case, it was radish that was grown up on, on station, but these pins have very fine tips that are covered with some binding chemistry to, to uh, pick up RNA. So for assays where this is applicable, it can eliminate 
a lot of this upstream, uh, these devices and the time needed to do it. So the mass that you need to send, the devices you need to build, the cost, everything it, is better. It's a, it's a very elegant solution. Uh, it looks like it is working. And um, we'll, we'll be hopefully doing other flights that, that use that technology. So um, we, we do test for, for this project in particular, uh, not everything that goes to the space station needs to be tested, but sometimes when it's fluidics, um, even though you know we, we know what capillary action is and how it works, there's still a lot of times that you uh, get uh, tricked or you, things show up that you didn't expect um, that you have to debug uh, before something flies. So we've done before these uh, parabolic flights uh, down in Houston at uh, Ellis uh, Air Base, and uh, you load your your uh, payload in. To the cargo area. It's basically like a like a 737 with everything stripped out except some seats in the back and all the padded walls. And I'm sure you've seen videos of that before. Uh, our payload test components are actually, and this is, a, is actually like a baby incubator, <laughs> like from a hospital, but obviously outfitted with, with all our equipment and ability for two people to get their hands in and, and do experiments while we do these dives. When I describe those dives, I'll just show you one of the fun parts there. So these dives are 10,000 foot climbs and parabolic dives, uh, 40 dives per flight. There's four flights typically in a campaign. So that's 160 dives worth of uh, data you can collect, but only 30 seconds at a time for true weightlessness. There's more than 30 if you don't need perfect zero G. And they do lunar dives also for 0.2 G, 0.6 G dives for, for uh, Martian dives. And every 10th one is, is uh, what they call a rest dive. Usually. You're too busy and scrambling because you know you can imagine how fast the clock is ticking when you're trying to use these small increments to do experiments but um uh every once in a while you can do some fun stuff like you just saw in that video <laughs> so so what we do then is uh, we go down to houston and, and train crew members uh, a lot of times this is like maybe six months before they launch and you know they get trained on so many things but they need to get the hands-on feel of everything the point is not to memorize procedures there's, there's Tons of procedures that are, you know, uplinked to station. Uh, it's to get them familiar with it and hopefully remember the the important things and have some muscle memory on, on operating all the devices. And so we do that uh, with, both with simple, you know, tabletop talk throughs and hands on. And then we go into these modules. This is uh, building nine in, in uh, uh, at JSC, which with full mockups of all the the modules of the, the space station. And inside, it's uh, outfitted to, to look and feel like, like the inside of the, the real modules. And so we set up the equipment there and, and work in that environment to get them used to, uh, to using the equipment. So there's been I trained 13 astronauts to date over the last, I guess, like six years. And uh, three of them out of 13 have performed, uh, I think we're up to 14, yeah, there it is, 14 sessions now. Uh, and they go from maybe two to four hours of course, it's, it's a much longer day than that because you have to do all the prep work, get on with uh, Houston, Huntsville and um, get all enabled, et cetera. And then afterwards, there's there's things to downlink and debrief and all that. So it's a long day, but you get about two to four hours of the, the crew members time, depending what the experiment is uh, in our case. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Jeff, oh, I'm sorry, the ones that. That uh, had used the system are uh, Jeff Williams, uh, Kate Rubens and Richie Arnold, and uh, we'll see uh, We'll see who's next for our, our next mission. So we uh, we communicate through our mission control. I, I use the term mission control, MMOC is what we call it. It's a multi-mission operation center. Uh, it's small, as you can see, compared to Houston's down in the, <laughs> the bottom right, which is the more famous one. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's basically all the same uh, communication and, and visuals and, and all that stuff. So we're, we're mic'd up and they set up video cameras so they can hear us, not see us, but we see and hear them as, as we talk everything through. And it's, it's basically in real time. I, I thought when I first started doing that, I, I thought there'd be some lag, you know, like seconds. I don't know how many seconds I thought it would be, but it's uh, maybe, seems like not more than say a half second lag. So it's, it's almost conversational once you get into, into the procedures. And there's, uh, there's racks and equipment on, on just about every surface of the, the space station, not in every module. Some are more for stowage, of course, but you get the idea in that little shot that 
you can work on a lot of different orientations in space and and sometimes the quarters are kind of tight. Uh, this is an example of our system being used by Jeff Williams. Uh, there's the sample press, uh, the sample prep module and uh, the rotors with those tubes I was describing and he's uh, pipetting into them. And you'll see he's in that glove bag there. There's a couple versions of that, but uh, that's needed depending on what type of containment we need and what, what tox, what toxicity certain reagents are. And uh, this is just the step I was mentioning where a cheaper, lighter version of trying to use the, the centrifuge on station, which is a bigger, uh, higher RPM, but heavier system, uh, heavier on earth, of course. So it's just about up maths. Once it's up, there's no problem. But uh, we are able to use cordless drill and spin and just get liquid to wet out our freeze dried reagents that are in those tubes waiting to, to hydrate the, the PCR reaction. Uh, Gate rooms has also used the system. You see her here with, without the glove bag. Uh, actually, this clip, I saw it was on the NBC News. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so she uh, uh, she's helping us do more fundamental experiments to, to switch the type of tubes we were using and things like that. And the kind of fluidic experiment she's doing there did not require the whole glove bag. Although, as I mentioned, she is the one that just earlier this week, we did two long sessions uh, in the early or late at night, early in the morning with, with her on using the pins to extract RNA. So we, uh, we did get the, the first few PCR, quantitative PCR results from space uh, using this system. And uh, then we, we compare results from ground and flight. These are just three different uh, concentrations of DNA in this standard. Uh, that was the first thing we've done. We've done E. coli cells, uh, mouse liver samples, uh, the radish just recently, but uh, you know it's meant to be used on all kinds of samples of biological interest in different PIs. And uh, the uh, PCR basically reads a signal as you amplify your target genes, you get more fluorescent as you make more of the, the gene of interest or copies of the gene of interest. And this is just showing that even though the flight data is a little choppier, uh, we got pretty nice uh, clustering results and, and, and CTs critical threshold values of, of where those cur curves start to come up, which is proportional to how much the concentration is of the target you're looking for. And uh, we, we saw a nice agreement between flight and ground experiments on these uh, different DNA concentration levels. Um, I just show this one as an example. As I said, there's E. coli and mouse, but this is just a, a nice uh, a quantified or well-controlled experiment because we know what we should get. <laughs> And this was one of the first uh, validation experiments we did. So that was uh, very uh, encouraging. Also in low Earth orbit, we do put up small sets. And uh, examples that I mentioned before were like the antibiotic resistance and, and the other bullets there. But I wanted at least do one example, which is a project called uh, ECAMSAT. And it is a, a small, SAT or small satellite spacecraft to study antibiotic resistance on E. coli. There's wild type of mutant strains in a microfluidic based system. Uh, the cells are fed nutrients to grow and then they're hit with the antibiotic. In this case, it's a gentamicin. And then we, we watch and track optically uh, color changes as, as the E. coli metabolism uh, causes uh, the compound Almar blue to go from blue to pink. And we, uh, that's how we quantitatively track what's going on. The, uh, the kind of uh, fluidics and systems like this are uh, reagent bags and uh, valving pumps, bubble traps that bring us down to a card. The card has 48 positions, each with these three wells. If you see the little circle there, this is a blow up of, of one of these sets of wells here. It's one main well where the uh, e. coli cells are, are launched. They're, they're waiting in there. Um, then there's an inlet and outlet channels that have filters and those keep the cells contained to, to a given well. There's 48 of them on a card. And of course, things like uh, waste bags need to be at the other end. And there is a uh, thermal control and excitation of LEDs that, oops, sorry, excitation of LEDs that go through the well and on the other side, detector boards that are all sandwiched together. And the, the fluidic part of the payload looks something like this. We would call this a, a three U. So one U is basically a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters or, or a liter size. And uh, 
However, there's also the, the bus or the, or the electronics side of the, the payload. So altogether, the payload ends up being a 6U system, which is about the size of a briefcase. Uh, ECAM set, oops, sorry, that's what I wanted. <laughs> I was cheating and using one of the, <laughs> one of the slides from our, the certificates from our mission to, uh, to show this kind of cool picture. So on uh, 2017, uh, in November, uh, ECAMSAT launched out of Wallops. Um, it was deployed then from the ISS. So they take it in and they put it in, in these racks that basically jettison smaller payloads out into orbit. And there you see it, that's a real shot of it being, being jettisoned from the ISS right there. And then 152 hours later, the experiment was completed. And basically, uh, as I mentioned, looking at the wild type and mutant strains, uh, looking at what happens when you go through a growth phase, challenging with antibiotics, and then uh, have a period of, of viability to see how they're killed off essentially. And these different stages, we get optical data from the growth. So we're looking both at optical density that tells us how many cells are there. Um, if you notice there's a fluid exchange and you might wonder, oh, what is the optical density drop off, it's because when fresh fluid was coming in, the cells temporarily get washed out of the way of the light path. And so it looks for a second like you're losing your cells, but they're still in those wells, they're contained by filters. And then later, uh, the, the curves show what's going on with the Alomar blue. The, the more pink it gets, that means there was metabolism. So here are the curves over time. The difference in these curves though, is which strains were knocked down more by the antibiotic. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, I'm on, on the engineering side and payload development side, but uh, I guess the scientifically one of the theories is that it is harder to kill bugs in, in space, uh, partly because weightlessness, just like on all of our cells, is a stress on their cells. And it kicks, I think the theory is that it kicks different cell pathways off that, that basically put their defenses up and make them a little harder to kill. So that's one of the kind of things I know that some folks are looking at. In the assist lunar range that I mentioned, so now we're beyond low Earth orbit, we uh, don't have the protection of the magnetosphere, and we can get those high radiation uh, doses, especially from the SBE, the solar particle events, and we want to know how that affects living organisms. Uh, BioSentinel is a small set to do that. It's uh, been developed, and, and actually flight devices, uh, I think the Testing is, I believe, all finished on the ground or almost finished. So it'll soon be waiting for, for its launch. Um, but it will go out and, and be jettisoned off uh, yeah, beyond Earth's orbit to get out near the, uh, the cislunar locations closer to the moon. And these, oops, these uh, high energy uh, radiation can cause a double stranded DNA breaks. In this case, we're using uh, strains of yeast to, to study that. There's a wild type, there's a mutant that's, that's very weak to radiation, it gets uh, cleaved easily. And then one that's uh, designed, I guess, to be more resistance, but that's the uh, double-stranded break strain of it. Uh, again, that's a little out of my <laughs> expertise. So our, our bio and science and molecular biology folks uh, do those parts of the assays. But what I think is interesting about this payload is, I call this sort of a, an inverse signal type of assay. And what I mean by that is you don't get positive growth of the yeast unless it did have a double-stranded break and that was repaired. So there are repair enzymes in, in all of our cells. And uh, th there's a trick they do with the uh, nutrients. It's a, I believe it's a leucine sort of starvation um, that causes them to only grow after the repair, which is sort of unintuitive. So you get increased signal if they were damaged, unlike the opposite, which you might think would be the way to do it, which is you put the yeast up there, you let them get damaged and you see how much poorly, how much more poorly they survive, which means you would get a reduced signal. So it's kind of nice because you're looking at a positive signal. Uh, so we shouldn't get as many false negatives. And by false negatives, I mean, oh, you would see the yeast degrading or deteriorating, but you wouldn't know, is it, is it because the yeast is, you know, not surviving well up there, or it's, a, it's a, you know, for some other reason, degrading, nothing to do with the, the high radiation dose. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting positive signal experiment. 
Uh, and I mentioned we looked at uh, LMR, uh, LMR Blue to quantify that growth. That's slated to launch this year. It was, uh, maybe with COVID, it might've been kicked out some more. I, I don't remember what, what vehicle it's on now. It was gonna be on EM1, Earth and Moon 1. Um, I think there was a couple vehicles that it was slated on over the past several years that it might get bumped from. But hopefully uh, it will launch uh, within, within the year. Um, the, the heart of it, so the microfluidics side that, that I work on, are these, uh, these cards that have, uh, in this case, 16 wells. And sort of like the ECAM SAT experiment that I showed before, those wells uh, have filters on each side that, that contain and keep the, the uh, biological species in there, in this case, the yeast. Um, but they're, it's pretty complex. There's 17 layers to this card with heaters and the optics uh, and the uh, microfluidic channels and, and et cetera. So when you get this stack all together, um, the side view of those channels, you can see there's some similarities with that ECAMSAT one, but it's a little simpler. In this case, we don't have side filters that are keeping everything in. We're detecting right through the filters. So we, we evolved to a, a different type of filter that had enough uh, trans mission to, to look at signal through it, both the excitation and emission. And that had some advantages uh, to making the, flu, the fluidics uh, easier and keeping the cells in the, in the path of light, et cetera. So uh, this is what it looks like when, uh, this is half of the payload. These are nine of those microfluidic cards on one lobe, if you will, of the fluidic payload. payload. There's two of these, so there's 18 cards that go up and they are sequentially run so they don't just all run at once I, I forget what the spacing is every two weeks maybe one is used uh, but also there are sensors on board uh, for uh, radiation sensors so if a solar if a solar particle event is detected one of the cards will be wetted out and the experiment will begin so there's there's both the just every two weeks frequency if there's not a big blast that we detect if there is a big blast then then we go for it and try to get that data so besides the fluidic payload, which is just in this box, there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's, there's guidance and uh, propulsion, um, and of course, solar power and all that. Uh, but here's what it looks like. All that, it still fits in the size of a briefcase here. And, and when it's uh, folded up with a solar razor down, that's, that's what it looks like right there. So uh, one thing is important in this payload is temperature isolation because since the experiments are spread out, you want to run, say, one card every two weeks. The other cards have to stay cold and dormant, but you need to warm one up to, uh, to around 23, yeah, 23C to, to run the experiment. So a lot of uh, thermal isolation work was done so that even though the cards are packed, uh, packed closely together, you can just really work with one and the others will stay cool or cold and dormant. And uh, this is the kind of the data we get. This is ground data, but uh, looking at the different uh, three different wavelengths that we track over time and uh, from the changes in color, we, we, we can track what's going on with the, the different yeast, uh, the, the wild type or the mutant. So I wanted to finish the, the, the second or last third here with, with some interplanetary payload examples of uh, systems that we develop. So I mentioned early, earlier a number of, of uh, sensors, if you, were, if you will, or, or uh, detection techniques, uh, nanopores or electrochemical analysis, uh, electrophoresis, mass spec, uh, optical imaging. And we have projects that use all of those. And I'll show, I think about three examples here. In general though, uh, just very generically, with an incoming sample, there's a lot of things that the fluid processing unit needs to do. And that's, that's one thing that I work quite a bit with um, before it can be sent to different analysis systems. So the kind of things that we do with the fluid processors are to uh, go ahead and, and harvest the sample from wherever it's waiting, what kind of vessel or cup. Um, we have to do some separations and degassing, uh, check the ionic strength, adjust pH, uh, concentrate samples, reconstitute uh, reagents that are dry on board that have been there for, for a long-term mission like uh, lyophilized or freeze-dried, uh, et cetera. And there's calibrants and controls. So all of this is going on in sort of this fluidic heart of the system. And then once the sample is properly prepared, 
we can parse it out to uh, different analysis techniques, whether it's microscopy um, or imagery, uh, electrophoresis, GC, mass, MS, um, et cetera, uh, different electrochemical um, sensors. And uh, Raman also has been used, I think, on other payloads, probably some of the Mars landers. So that's just generically what, what we're dealing with here to be able to send samples to all those analysis means. So let's take an example here. Uh, this project is called ELSA and it's aimed at Enceladus looking for life signatures there. They say <laughs> habitability as well. I, I didn't choose that word, but <laughs> at least looking for signatures of <laughs> ancient life or even current life there. Um, this view from the Cassini spacecraft, this photo from 2009, shows that these, these plumes uh, blast out of the surface of, the, of this moon of, uh, of Saturn. So we know that there's some kind of strong hydrothermal or other energy that's causing basically a geyser like Old Faithful to go off. But when it does, it's a, you know, such a cold environment that you end up with ice crystals in the plume instead of, instead of water droplets. And because the, the moon is small and has a low mass, gravity is low. So these plumes linger before they settle back down. So what that allows us to do is come up with missions that can send a probe there, orbit the moon and fly through those plumes and collect uh, those ice particles. Cause we wanna find out what's in them. Cause we know that they came from below the surface. And, and that's, that's what's interesting to the astrobiologists is to find out uh, what's down there. Um, I believe like, like Europa that uh, the reason uh, Enceladus has a very kind of crazed and cracked looking surface is that there is a water layer underneath, which would be tidal, but it's, it's trapped in a, an ice shell. And so gravity from the planet, Saturn, Saturn in this case, or Jupiter for Europa, uh, as you orbit, you know, just like our tides, uh, there's, there's stress inside where that the, the, the sea <laughs> below is trying to shift. And uh, apparently, it, I think that's pretty well agreed upon that that's why you see these, these fractures in the surfaces, the icy surfaces of, of moons like Europa and Enceladus. So with these probes, they're designed to go what we call flying low and slow. So maybe 500 miles an hour, say this, the speed of a jetliner. Uh, the reason we call it low and slow is that when a probe is on a mission or you have some other spacecraft that's basically transiting interplanetary, those are moving at four or five kilometers per second. And I think you might've heard numbers like that if you watch any of the Perseverance landing, but, but uh, yeah, five kilometers per second versus 500 miles an hour. So this is very much lower and slower <laughs> so that we can uh, fly through these plumes and, and collect ice crystals, melt them, and then analyze them on board. There's a, a, a one meter diameter horn that's been des designed to fly through the plumes. And at the bottom of the horn is a tiny pan. It only holds 50 microliters, five zero microliters. And that's our sample. <laughs> that's all we have to work with. So we need microfluidics to, to harvest that and to manipulate it and to mix it with things uh, because obviously we don't have a lot to work with. Um, then our, our fluid handling sends it off, as, as you saw in the more generic slide, to, to other downstream analyses. Uh, there's uh, capillary electrophoresis. Um, there's, uh, yeah, uh, this is the micro wet chemistry are, are also electrochemical sensor techniques, et cetera. But this would all be happening on that, on that probe and it would keep orbiting and doing many flybys and continuing to try to collect, collect, collect. So uh, that would be uh, exciting if we get this all the way to, to launch. Here's what one of those manifolds actually looks like that does all the fluidics. You can see it's about a six by six inch on a side uh, structure. It's multi-layered. So from the side view, you'd see about three layers of, of channels and vias running all over the place. We use uh, piston uh, metering pumps that are driven by a stepper motor to very accurately move volume, small volumes of fluid around. Uh, these are uh, solenoid valves that you see on the, the silver cylinders there. We have areas that we, we do concentration. So these are hydrophobic membranes that allow us to evacuate uh, water vapor off a sample and concentrate it down so that we can get better uh, signal to noise. Uh, bubble traps, of course, to, to, to remove any 
um, gaps in the liquid, uh, air gaps, et cetera. So that, that kind of gives you an idea of what, what the plumbing looks like for some of these payloads. So another example I wanted to talk about was some payloads that are destined for Europa. And it also, I think it's well agreed upon in the scientific community is, is uh, uh, an ice covered crust, but in this case, very thick. I've heard estimates of like one or two kilometers thick, the ice crust, but they believe that there is uh, an ocean below. And you see signs of it as well. Besides the fissures that happen from that, I think the, the grab or the tidal sort of hydrodynamics inside, um, there are also sort of uh, these, these geysers that, that go off because of the, the internal pressures, uh, sort of like you saw on a smaller scale on Enceladus. So uh, here's an example of a payload to, to go as, as one of the sensors on, on a lander to um, Europa. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so many targets, I almost said Enceladus. Um, this, this one, MICA, it's a microfluidic IC world chemistry analyzer, but um, it's basically an electrochemical analyzer that has a, an array of 48 ion selective electrodes, ISEs, that do the sensing. Um, these are part of a system called WICL. This is a wet chemistry lab, and it was part of a previous payload on the Phoenix uh, lander on, for Mars. Uh, so we'd like to repurpose the heart of that and then build the fluidics around it to, to do the kind of um, sensing and, and, and analysis that they'd like to do on Europa. So the goals are to detect and characterize any inorganic indicators of past or present life and uh, characterize the, the non-ice composition. So what else, what is in the ice? Is it just frozen water or because of all the activity that we know is below the surface, is there, is there something else there? So in this example, Mica, um, a sample cup from the lander holding about five cc's, uh, or maybe it's a one, one cc in this case, there's a different, different landers and different projects <laughs> with different size samples. It looks like this, is, this one is one or one to five. Maybe one is the minimum. Uh, there's a company we work with uh, called Honeybee that, that works on the, the mechanics of the sample cup transfer and how, how the lander would, would mechanically grab it and put it into our part of the payload, put it into our, our sample uh, vessel here. But basically, MICA is designed to, to carry reagents. Um, this, is, this plumbing is relatively simple. I mean, <laughs> it's not as simple as the schematic looks, but it's less complicated than what you saw in some of the previous slides. There's less going on. It's more about pumping re reagents, uh, wetting out the array of sensors, um, and then, uh, you know, of course, processing those, those signals. This is what those arrays look like. So there's a fluid path that, that goes through all of these 48 uh, ISC or sensor positions, and just the valves and bubble traps and, and all that is what you see down here. Uh, so there's pumps and, and vents and, oops, and bubble traps. Uh, and, and different calibrants on board that, that would have to be uh, rehydrated once once the uh, the moon was reached and, and the lander started its operations. To give you a, a physical feel with this rendering, um, so this payload, this looks like it would be about a three U payload, would have the um, that that mica block that you saw uh, would be right here, and the other uh, uh, sample cup mechanisms and, and valving, et cetera, and then the boards that run it. So it would have this, this sub uh, system of the payload would have about the same size and volume of what you saw the picture, pictures of like the uh, uh, ECAM set payload and, and that size. So uh, briefcase size. And here's a picture of our actual part of our manifold just to kind of show you what it looks like with all the components there that, that I had just mentioned. And so we're, we're, we're testing now to, to integrate the, the ISC array to the, to the main fluidic block that does all the fluidic uh, manipulation and, and transport. Another project uh, destined for, I think Europa would be the first location, uh, is to uh, get a, an ice sample from the surface, 
melt it, and then do imaging. So in this case, there would be fluorescent staining of the sample, and there would be lyophilized reagents on board that have to be wetted out and, and reconstituted. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when, when you reach the, the moon and are getting ready to do the operations. And then there's a, a high resolution a camera that, that does imaging and we're seeking any kind of biological molecules. So here's a, a manifold that does the fluidics for this particular project. Um, and this, this disc here has filters of various sizes. So it allows us the melted sample to come in, go through a coarse filter, then finer, then finer to catch different size particles. And there could be actual just physical hard, you know, tiny, you know, say grain, grains of sand type of particles. Uh, but what we're really looking for is the ones that make it past the finest mesh or to the finest mesh filter. And those would be more of biological interest. So are there any lipids in there or membrane proteins or nucleic acids? And these cameras and imaging systems are, are high resolution enough to actually be able to detect uh, biomolecules like that. So I'll wrap up with, uh, how are we doing for time, Elizabeth? Are we, uh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. We're almost, almost ready for questions, right? Yes. Let me just yeah, go through this. This is the last part. This is um, mm -hmm. uh, something called Excalibur. This is to look for lipid biomarkers. And I mentioned trying to get a picture of those earlier, but it turns out that lipids are some of the uh, longest sur surviving molecules. So instead of uh, with DNA and amino acids being way down here on the scale of billions of years and proteins, uh, lipids can be way out here, like a billion years old in, in uh, whatever record or regolith or ice that they're trapped in. And in the scientific community, they, they think they know that um, it's, it's a sign of life when you see certain types of these uh, lipid uh, derivatives. Uh, and this just kind of shows examples of molecules that might be like in a clay or some kind of regolith that are, you know, not biotic and, and ones that are molecules that we think must have had some kind of other mechanism like in a cell or to, you know, life type mechanism to, to produce. So it's kind of, it's pretty interesting. There's three targets for this. Um, one is lunar, the shadowed uh, craters have some ice in there that uh, DIs would like to analyze and see what's in there. <laughs> if it's just sterile, you know, ice and water or if there's something else in there. On Mars, there are environments um, where from all, you know, for a bunch of reasons, flybys and, and uh, sensors from distance and on the ground uh, rovers and sampling, of course, uh, gives um, them a very good idea of where they'd like to look for uh, some biomolecules. And Europa, as we mentioned earlier, has uh, eruption sites and fault lines where activity suggests there might be something interesting to look at. We'll find out. So Excalibur uh, uh, accepts a sample, uh, 50 grams in this case. Uh, this is the, the Mars version or example where you're taking in regolith. So you're taking in a, basically a ground up soil or chunks of soil, you're grinding it up, comminuting we call it. So reducing the particle size, doing extraction with organic solvents, filtering that out through various filter stages and then concentrating it from 250 microliters all the way down to only 100 micro, sorry, 250 mLs down to only 100 microliters. So it's that 100 microliters that we're finally left with that we want to do the analysis on with mass spec to see if there are any lipids in there. Uh, I happen to work on the concentrator end of this. So this is what it looks like on the lab bench, um, just with the temperature sensors, pressure sensors, vacuum packs. This is a, a glass version so that we can see what's going on inside. We don't want the solvent to sort of boil and too violently bubble up so that we might, so that it would get into the vacuum line that's trying to evaporate off the solvent but leave behind lipids, which will end up in a, in a little uh, 100 microliter feature down in this cup at the bottom here. So uh, those are the kind of, that's what it looks like on the bench when <laughs> we're working on some subsystems here. So anyway, uh, that's what I had for today and hopefully uh, gave you some examples of uh, biological analysis systems that we develop for these, these different applications or regimes, either on ISS, uh, small sets, go out either in LEO or in Cislunar, and then what we're working on for the for the life detection or search for life probes. So with that, if 
you uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yes, so we do have uh, quite a few questions. Um, starting with the ones that were submitted before the webinar. Um, do you know of career opportunities in astrobotany or um, career opportunities that are specializing in plant sciences? You know, <laughs> I actually don't, I, you know, I'm all, more on the engineering side. However, I work with people that I'm sure do. <laughs> so more the, uh, the, the biologists, molecular biologists and, and, and scientists on that end of the project. So uh, I'd be perfectly happy to uh, give any contact info from the folks that work with those scientists directly. Uh, I deal, of course, with our with our local ones that figure out what model samples we're going to use and things like that. And I'm sure I'm sure they know people in the field. So yeah, I'd be happy to forward any info or contacts. Thank you. Um, what is an emerging an emerging space uh, bio, biological analysis tool that you think will revolutionize the field in the near future? Two things, uh, you, you know, within the realm of what I deal with. I mentioned that we do PCR analysis uh, for that RNA expression, for example, and also to be a front end for sequencing. Well, sequencing, I mean, for, for decades, it's, it's really been the technique that I think in a lot of people's mind was going to be and is, you know, the, the, the next generation, the future way to very efficiently uh, get information about what's what's on the, the code of nucleic acids, for whether it's the RNA or, or DNA. And terrestrially, that, that's pretty much happened. I mean, now there's companies that can do high throughput sequencing. Um, it's really for discovery though. There still are sometimes some problems with how uh, low of a uh, you know, concentration of something or a particular uh, target gene you can detect. And so it's, it's really good for broad swaths of discovery, looking and saying, what is in this genome? Uh, but then when it comes down to, to really quantitatively looking at differences, a lot of those experiments are still done with PCR. So they're, they're complementary, but I think the future view still is, as it's been for several decades, is to really have sequencing kind of take over and, and do almost almost everything. <laughs> it hasn't happened and maybe, maybe PCR and sequencing will continue to be complementary, but the sequencing field and miniaturized sequencing, I think is it's definitely you know, a hot area. Uh, the other one, the nanopores that I mentioned for, for doing sizing, so those can be used for sequencing as well. Since we don't know if, if we do find polyionic molecules that are information carri carriers like DNA or RNA, but of some other structure, uh, you can't necessarily use nanopores that, that do the same type of sequencing that we do terrestrially. But we can do sizing so we can find out if there is a polyionic molecule and how long it is and, and maybe information about its, you know, the links in its chain. It's, it's uh, uh, I won't say nucleic acid, but it's, you know, it's, it's makeup of its submolecules or atoms. So that is also just a whole nanopore and miniaturized nanopore field. There, there's some now that you, you can put on a pen drive, the actual working end of, of the, the, the nano uh, poor chip. Of course, you need to support that with all the fluidics and everything that's around it. But it's getting more and more compact, more and more affordable. And I think that's another one that's going to keep being big. And we have a question about slide seven. Um, sure. I'll wait for you to get to that slide. Yes. So do the membranes um, employed in the bubble removal system saturate and get contaminated? And how long do they last? Okay, yeah, so these, in this version of the debubbler, which does have a hydrophobic membrane, the other one, as I mentioned, is totally surface tension driven. Uh, there's a filter over here to act as a, a vent at some point, but it's not intended to be in contact with the fluid. So over here, that question is, is correct. Those fluids and any air bubbles or gaps are, are running directly over the membrane. So basically we do tests and we, we run through the assays that we're working on to make sure there's not some non-specific binding to, to the filter. Um, there are other payloads that we're working on. When I say payload, we're still on, on the bench. Um, in fact, it's in the nanopore sizing projects where um, we are concerned 
with say say there's a DNA standard uh, like Lambda DNA that we're using as a as a model sample when we flow it through our concentrator or bubble traps. Yeah, are we losing anything? Are are things like DNA or other molecules getting caught up somewhere and sticking anywhere? So we answer the question by actually running it on assays of interest and checking the uh, uh, if there's any loss in in a you know in a key in a key species going through there. But it is it is of of concern or of interest. Um, I think so far it hasn't been a showstopper with with any type of assays that we've used them on so far. I have another question related to bubbles. Um, this one is asking, how do you make sure that no water bubbles can occur during to dirt? Uh, due to the different behavior of water and lack of gravity. So I guess, can you explain a little bit more about um, sure. the, and, and the actually, in that slide? Yes, in fact, I think maybe I'll just, yeah, let me just pull up this slide again. In a lot of research on station, bubbles and bubbles and removals turns out to be a huge issue. And, uh, you know, we're not used to thinking about it with anything we put in a, a test tube or a vial, but in, in microgravity, I mean, even examples like um, like a fuel injector for like propulsion, like imagine you have a, a, a uh, you know combustion um, of you know flame off of a off of a uh, propulsion that's burning a, a fuel. Just things we take for granted, like how the fuel gets there, um, does not work the same without gravity. So you really have to rely on surface tension and uh, things like that. So there's a whole field of sort of combustion study that's done up on station. Um, and in general, it, yes, every payload we do, bubble removing with bubble traps or with manually implemented debubblers are always key steps in the process. And you can imagine that, um, you know, in the microscopic world, when you have a human, you know, crew member, they can see a lot of times where a bubble is as they're doing the experiment. And then we can, you know, make sure we get that out um, through by motivating it, uh, by, you know, flicking it or by getting it to that a membrane that would reject it. However, with aut autonomous payloads and with handling really tiny vol volumes, like I mentioned for the ELSA, the Enceladus project, um, we only have 50 uh, microliters of sample so, you know, if you get bubbles somewhere in your fluidics, it's really going to screw up your ability to accurately meter and move things around, especially when it's all autonomous and you have to either do it by timing or by some other sensing on the, on the manifold to know that, yes, fluid reached this point or to know that, oh, I see um, uh, resistance or conductivity change. Uh, a slug of air just passed the sensor, not liquid. You know, you have to really uh, be careful with, with that level of detail. So that's, yeah, that's all related to the bubble removal as well. Okay, um, next question. Do you think there could be life forms in the sub-oceans of Europa? Um, boy, you know, it sure would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there's something of interest down there. Yeah, I, you know, when I, when I think of these projects, uh, you know, we kind of joke around like wherever we send these pros, we're not expecting to find a dinosaur or an alligator. You know, we'd be <laughs> we'd be happy with any even sign of ancient extinct life. You know, that would be hugely exciting. And the next level above that would be to find a small, you know, cell or, or biomolecule, even if it's not part of a of an organism that we recognize. That would be the, the next level of excitement. But if there was actually living functioning organisms, I mean, wow, that would be the, the holy grail on that one. Um, this next question is about the RNA pins. Comment that the RNA pins seem really small um, with the risk of them getting lost and a uh, high puncture risk. Was there pushback from NASA about implementing those on station? It's a good question. <laughs> it's like someone that might have been involved in our, our ops. <laughs> yeah, let me just bring that up. It's a, it's a valid and, and real question that, that we're facing. So, yeah. I, the, the, the PI that uh, invented this, uh, Neil Cruz is his name, is he and uh, uh, our other partner, uh, Gargana, who's in both a, a university lab and I believe Neil also 
we might be with the startup now, but anyway, um, uh, the point is they developed this, this pin sampling technique and yeah, the pins are very fine. If you look here, there's a, there's the, the shaft of the pin is probably less than a, a millimeter. So the end here is super fine. Um, and it, that's about five millimeters long. So the head of the pin is maybe uh, three millimeters, three millimeter features up here to grab with, with a tool that it's designed for this. So the way it's implemented now, yes, it, it is ergonomically tricky. Um, you know, on the bench, it, it's not as hard, of course, but you get up in microgravity, you have the complexity of uh, even when we do our tests, of course, in the glove bag on, on Earth, um, the complexity of just reflections or visibility and dexterity, there's, there's multi layers of the gloves that you're in. And it can be tricky to insert the pins and then retrieve them and put them in the throat of these tubes here. The throat of the tubes are about six millimeters in diameter. So you're, you're trying to hit that target and release that pin and inject it into the tube. There's a little ejection feature on the, on the pin grabber. And uh, yes, it can be challenging. I think because it's so elegant and because uh, we've already seen, uh, I haven't seen the process data, but I saw it in real time on the screen, the PCR data, we, we did get uh, signal, we did get uh, PCR to work on, on detecting the, the, the RNA targets for this experiment on, on the radish here. So that already means to me that um, I hope we'll be able to propose versions that, that start to simplify uh, the use of the pins and uh, make the the uh, handling of it and the dexterity dexterity of it easier for the crew. And part of that has to do with how we use the glove bag and uh, um, maybe even uh, one thing I, I was would like to look into is even maybe changing the type of glove that's that's in those glove bags. And I'm sure that will <laughs> set off a huge uh, cascade of events with with design, testing, and validation, of course, which is fine. But anything we can do to make the crew's life easier really helps them to, to help us. Great. Um, so we are out of time, but there are quite a few more questions. Um, I'm not sure if you have other obligations after this presentation. No, that's fine. Ask away. OK. OK, great. So the next question is about the, um, the radish pins again. Can the radish pins be used to extract root RNA from finer roots um, grown in other systems such as veggie? So um, as far as the, I, I guess this is, this question is mostly about how small of a piece of material can you get the pin in, I think is the way yes. I'm interpreting that question. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a good question. Um, as it's configured now, um, you know, you need at least a few millimeters of, of, of tissue to get into, whether it's plant or, uh, you know, uh, cell tissue or, or whatever. Um, we, we were going to, on this experiment, we were going to stick pins in the, uh, the shafts of the, the, the leaves as well, uh, which is a smaller target than radish itself. We didn't do that. We ended up going around sort of the equator of the radish and putting 16 pins in. Kate Rubens did that for us. Um, so I think as long as you can hold your specimen and as long as it's at least, say, a two millimeter cube or larger, <laughs> you can you could get a pin in it. It would just it would be hard to handle just because somehow that that sample would have to be anchored down somewhere unlike a lab bench where you could kind of lay on a clean surface and kind of stab it <laughs> in mm -hmm. microgravity, you know, uh, of course it'll float around. So everything has to somehow be anchored and that would be a little challenging, but yes, th theoretically, if you can hold the thing, that's at least a two millimeter cube size, you, you should be able to get a pin in it. And um, that might be bigger than some of the, the roots that maybe the, the person was, you know, wondering about in their question, but. The next question is about um, the seals and the microfluidic devices. How do the seals and microfluidics react with one another in the payload while it experiences microgravity? And are your seals made in-house? So, so there's, in, in, in our microfluidic plumbing in general, there's 
a lot of interfaces, right? You have a, a tubing that comes in and meets, meets a block, let's say, and there's a port there that you, you're, you're screwed into and you're torqued down onto. And we use uh, off-the-shelf fittings from that. Uh, we use a lot of them from uh, uh, IDEX as an example. They, they supply a lot of uh, the fittings for, for fine, when I say fine tubing, let's say 16th inch ID, one millimeter ID. So one, inter one interface that we have to be careful with and we deal with a lot is what happens when you screw a fitting like that in, it kind of flush mounts into a, a via that's waiting on the block. So you have a tube, a threaded fitting, and it flushly meets a feature in the block <clears throat> from which the via or channel goes into the block. We use, uh, you can just have it flush mount, just a physical seal, <clears throat> but you can imagine that there's times you don't want to just depend on a physical seal because you're worried if anything in that gap isn't flat. So we use O-rings in critical places like that, even you know tiny O-rings, ones that are just a few millimeters in diameter. Uh, total diameter, not, you know, not thickness. And uh, th that's an example uh, of a type of seal that that's important to get right. We use, uh, in some places, we'll use like a flat gasket, you know, like a trimmed flat gasket to which you, you, you screw down basically like a cap onto a, onto a cavity on the block that's below. And we rely on, on the gasket to provide a seal. Um, also, so on the ISS, a lot of that plumbing is more, you know, macroscopic, right? It's, it's sort of a, I would call it like mesofluidics, you know, millimeter scale, not micrometer scale, micrometer scale. In that case, we use a lot of uh, barb, like lure barb fittings. So let's say 16 inch lure barbs that, uh, that you have tubing that connects to it. And one of the ways we improve seals there is we spring wrap the tubing, uh, especially where it grabs onto a, a barb. And that's to basically uh, give it some rigidity so it doesn't flex or pinch. And it also kind of hardens the, uh, the, the, the grab, you know, onto, onto barbs like that or interfaces like that. So anyway, those are like three interfaces that come to mind that that it's important for us to get good seals on. Oh, I'll give you one more example, especially for the light detection probes. There are some very expensive valves. I mean, I think they're like 30 grand a piece or something like that, but they're you know highly tested and have really high specs on them to be very good seals for long amounts of time. So if you're going on a mission, say like to Enceladus, it could be like an eight year mission, I think just to get there. Uh, I've seen different numbers and I guess it depends how long you go there too, but maybe like a 10 year total mission. So um, you need to have valves and seals that can keep wet reagents wet and keep dry reagents dry for years and then hydrate them and, you know, initiate an experiment or an autonomous detection protocol when, when you arrive at your destination. So there are some very expensive valves that are, uh, and they've been used on, on uh, other landers and things, and I'm, I'm sure they were already used in, in uh, uh, probably some of Mars rovers and other other spacecraft. Um, but that's another example of like critical seals that have to last for for years. They have to be radiation tolerant, of course, for long journeys, uh, and uh, and uh, of course temperature ranges. You know, being able to uh, uh, survive extreme cold temperatures and that type of thing. Um, this next question is about ELISA. What role does the impact between the ice particles and the cone play in the potential contamination of the samples? Is there a concern regarding cross-contamination between different orbital passes? Yeah, let me go down to that section. So that project, so ELSA, yep, is the... Elsa. Yep, that's fine. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, it's... A, there's so many names, so many acronyms. I think I'm on seven different projects with seven different acronyms, you know? <laughs> and sometimes with overlapping team members, it gets confusing. <laughs> but anyway, um, so let me speak to that a little bit. I think this is probably a place to talk about it. So I think what I understood was, was the question about I don't know if the person would be able even to answer you. So I'll, I'll, 
I'll uh, surmise what I, what I think it is. There's a couple ways to do experiments. One is you uh, access a sample, and that one sample is what you work on. And then sequentially, when you're done with that whole experiment, you get another fresh sample and put it through either the same payload that's been kind of cleaned out, washed out, or maybe a twin, you know, sister payload that's ready, virgin one that's ready for a new sample. On some experiments though, whether it's collection of uh, regolith from, from Mars that's ground up or, 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 or ground up or drilled up ice from Europa or crystals like this in plumes of Enceladus, you wanna have the capability to accept multiple samples in and collect them sequentially before you run anything. And so this would be an example of that. So if I understand the question, I think there was two parts. One might've been about interaction or contamination, but first I'll just say that multiple passes would be collecting crystals in these plumes to, uh, to get enough sample, to, to hopefully get enough sample to, to analyze. Um, and there's, there's a lot of engineering design in how, how ricocheting particles uh, as this is you know, flying past. Now the, the atmosphere is basically almost a vacuum. So it's not like you're you know, going into wind resistance or anything, but the particles, you know, of course, at 500 miles an hour are gonna ricochet around this big one meter uh, horn or cone that's going all the way down to this little uh, five millimeter diameter collection pan. And there's special features in the bottom of it to, to account for those ricochets and how to have things bounce in the right directions and settle in that pan. As far as contamination, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, I don't know if it was the point of, in the questioner's mind, but as you hit surfaces with high velocity, say these ice crystals are slamming into the material of the cone, maybe part of the question is, are you dislodging or abrading, you know, ablating parts of the, of the hardware? And um, I guess the answer to that could be yes. They're on the ground, we do experiments firing at high velocity. There's a high velocity gun here at Ames and it's probably done elsewhere, firing high velocity particles <laughs> into, into test system and kind of figuring out where the particles bounce and if we collect them all and all that kind of stuff. From those experiments, I guess we could get an idea of that. I haven't seen any samples to analyze for it to see what sort of contaminating debris might have gotten knocked around. However, in the processing of the sample, you know, we, we can tell the difference between, you know, a tiny chunk of, uh, of plastic or metal that was, that was uh, you know, abraded off a, a surface and the kind of molecules that, that we're looking for. So I think that removes most of the issue. But yeah, it's a good question. Another question related to that horn. Um, are there electrostatic repulsion or uh, attraction features to that horn to sweep out um, any re residuals from a previous pass? Or is there anything on the surface um, aiding in that sampling? Yeah, uh, I get the point of the question. And I don't think I know um, what, you know, what coatings or, or layers are on the horn after it's fabricated. I don't know if there's some kind of deposition of, you know, to put to put the, the layers you want to just on the outside surface to sort of skin it. Um, so I, I'm not really knowledgeable enough in the horn materials to answer the question. We do worry about things like the mechanism. I don't have a slide of it here, but at the bottom of that horn where this little 50 microliter pan is, which is about, uh, let's say, let's just say 10 millimeters, five millimeters in diameter, five. There's, there's a rotary system that after the bottom of the horn collects it, it rotates in another position that allows our, our block here, our processing block to access it, to send liquid to it, to wet it out and to harvest that liquid back so we can start manipulating it on, on the microfluidic block. There, there have been, I think, concerns about, uh, well, first of all, you're worried about getting no sample, that would be bad, but also too much sample or jamming up some of the, you know, the cup and some of the seals around it, because if you have sliding seals where, where the collected sample cup has to slide under interface to get to its next position to communicate with the next part of the payload. Um, I know that uh, a 
applied physics lab that's a partner in this had has thought about that and worked on that how how those rotary seals are going to work what parts of the system need to be heated you know and kept that uh, temperatures ab above the, the very cold temperatures that the plume would be at initially so yeah i think that's probably all i can say about that i i don't know it's too much more about the materials at least the outer skin material on the horn okay and um, another question this is also related to the um to those missions the forward planetary protection norms for missions to the uh, Saturn, Saturnian systems are presumably pretty strict. While this doesn't really impact most other instruments, are there sterilization requirements? Um, are these sterilization requirements onerous for some of the payloads that you've presented? Um, for example, I'm thinking a sample, a simple high temperature bakeout might denature some of the reagents that you mentioned in your presentation. Yeah, this I know a little bit about. I, I am. Uh just a very small fraction of time on a, on a project for under the umbrella of planetary protection, which, uh, you know, first sounds like we're shooting down incoming meteors with lasers or something or asteroids, but, uh, and it's, it's basically to do ultra sensitive uh, sensing of any like protein fragments or something that are on the surfaces of components of a payload before it goes out. Right. So make sure we're not, we're not bringing with us the thing that we're detecting. Um, so yes, it, it, it is going to get more and more, uh, stringent how clean things have to be. Um, you know, some things can be autoclaved to, to, to be clean. So there's different kinds of clean, right? One you could say is, um, it's like abiotic. There's just, there's nothing living or no molecules like that. Others, you could just say, oh, we can put up with a certain amount of specks of degree, just like five, like four degree in a clean room, you know, like, oh, to what, to what cleanliness is this clean room? But as far as things that could show up in detection, uh, besides using various techniques, I guess you can do uh, uh, like gamma uh, radiation. Sometimes we uh, uh, radiate parts to make them sterile. Uh, sometimes we autoclave, uh, it depends on the materials, of course. And if there's like, say, electronics on it, you know, you're not going to put that in an autoclave, for example. Um, the, so the techniques for swiping, swabbing surfaces and figuring out if the payload is clean, cleaner than we've ever done before, is, is, is being worked on now. Uh, for instance, say like Voyager or something. Um, <laughs> oh, this is a good time to mention. So BioSentinel will actually be the first time that we know of in human history that man has sent something living beyond Earth's orbit. So that's kind of a little interesting to think about. However, the reason I mention this is the caveat, the caveat is, for instance, say the Voyager probe, you know, from 40 years ago or more, or 40, I guess. Um, undoubtedly, you know, the techniques then probably weren't as good for keeping things clean and checking them and knowing how clean they are. So we probably have unintendedly already sent, you know, some kind of molt spore or something that was stuck to Voyager and it's now, you know, beyond the edge of our solar system. So, but intentional ones, BioSentinel will be, will be the first in history. Um, so anyway, back to the question. Yeah, it, it's a, it's an issue. I mentioned a few of the sterilization techniques. I'm sure there's other ones that are some kind of liquid sterilizing, you know, bleach like other other uh, chemistry than bleach, but um, that then after you do any wet processing, you have to get that out again, rinse it, dry it, somehow vacuum dry it. So with wet processing, that that is an issue to make sure you can get everything dry again um, uh, before before you package things up. So hopefully maybe that answered a little bit of that question. <laughs> I have one last question. Um, I think this is a clarification for that timeline that you showed comparing uh, DNA um, and nucleic acids to um, lipids. So the question was, aren't lipids sensitive to oxida oxidation and degradation over time? I'm surprised that they last longer than amino and nucleic acids. Um, so can you, can you just clarify the, the timeline that's shown here? Are you saying that lipids last longer or 
older in origin. I concur with that question because I was amazed too when I <laughs> started on this project and, you know, not being from the, the, the astrobiology science side of it, um, I, I thought, well, I, I would have thought, you know, I know DNA is, is more bulletproof than, than many molecules, which, you know, on Earth, you can get, I don't know how many thousands of years old samples, maybe, maybe millions. Um, but millions is still way down in the noise from billions, right? So those arrows are still way down here for DNA, amino acids and proteins. So with regard to the question, I agree. I, I was surprised that, that lipids or fragments or lipid derivatives could survive that long, but apparently they have found, I don't want to misspeak here, but I think they have been found in, in rock. And I forget if this is from meteors or, or samples from, from, from earth where they have been found in very ancient, you know, fragments of certain types of rock or, uh, I guess, I guess it won't be called regolith, but yeah, anyway, I'm a little out of my depth here, but I had the exact same reaction to, to thinking how is a lipid surviving a billion years <laughs> but apparently it can it can get entrapped um especially uh, with uh, with some projects related to excalibur we're looking at uh some of the systems are designed to harvest say lipids from ice some from regolith there's a third version that's designed to extract it from uh carrigens which are complicated molecules, you know, in my mind, I'll, I'll describe it simply in, in the engineer's terms, but the kind of uh, uh, macro molecular agglomerates that you might be like trapped in like, like a clay or something like that. And I hope I'm not misdescribing that too much, but we are working on techniques uh, for lipids entrapped in materials like that. And those are more challenging to extract than, than from ice or than from just grinding up regolith soil, say from, from the Mars surface. So hopefully that, that touches a little bit on that question. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that they lasted that long either. <laughs> uh, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for sticking around extra to make sure all the questions were answered. Um, Really appreciated the presentation, a lot of excellent information. Um, and again, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to speak with us. And thank you everyone for attending. Sure, and like I said, feel free if there's follow-up questions, you know, you have my email and I, I can help. If I can't answer them, I can, I can get them to people who can. <laughs> thank you, we appreciate that. All right, thanks for organizing. All right, everyone. And uh, for for future webinars, we'll be sending out email blasts um, and you can find them announced on our social media as well. So thank you. All right. So uh, if we're all set, I'll sign off too then. All set. Thank you. Okay. See you guys. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Bond. <laughs> You're welcome.